Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. We're going to study and understand the king, the keys, and the kingdom. We're going to be focusing on what I call the three most important components in the Bible. The Bible is not a religious book. The Bible contains the communique from heaven. It is a memo from God. It is an email from heaven. And this email sent to us from heaven was sent to us by God to reveal to us his plan for mankind, his plan for planet Earth, and his plan for his impact on this planet through his mankind. That's what this memo is about. So today I want you to understand that we are about to enter a realm of teaching that will transform your life completely. I am believing God that when you have captured this concept of the king, the keys and the kingdom that you will become a completely different person everything in your life is going to be changing over the next 12 months and into the next year because I believe that what you are about to learn is what Jesus has been trying to teach us for ages the church has been very very busy but not effective the church has been teaching a message that Jesus did not give them to teach. The church has been focusing on things that God has been finished with for a long time. And we need to get back to the original message, the original assignment, and the original purpose for which God created mankind and why he established the church. I believe out of this series, God is going to not only bring transformation in our country from the top down and the bottom up, he's going to bring transformation in business, he's going to bring transformation in law, in government. This series will impact the way we parent children, how we stay married, how we deal with our family lives. This kingdom series from this point is going to focus you on understanding how to walk in the simplicity of this document and see practical evidence every day in your life. This series is probably going to be the most important message I've taught in my lifetime because there is no more important message to give. Jesus made a statement in the book of John and when he made this statement, when I read it, I was afraid of what I was reading because it created some theological problems for me. And it made me very concerned about my education because it showed that I was miseducated. To be miseducated means that you are an expert in foolishness. And I'm speaking now seriously as a man who's been called by God to help you come out of the darkness of the struggles that you've been going through, like I was going through as well, of religion. Jesus made a statement that also made me understand that it's possible to be so busy on doing something wrong, you think it's right. And sometimes you've been, you've been doing something wrong so long, you're afraid to change it even though you know it's wrong now because you might upset some people nothing is worse than self-deception except knowing you deceive and still being deceived and Jesus made a statement he said and I'm gonna read this verse in a minute through the series but he said this the words he said from the time of Adam all the way to Moses and all the way to John the Baptist 
he says, the law and the prophets have been preached. From the time of Moses to the time of John the Baptist, the law and the prophets have been preached. This verse changed my life. He says, but now, everybody say, but now. In other words, Jesus cut off and stopped a dispensation in one statement. He closed an entire era in one statement. He said, from the time of Moses, all the way to John the Baptist, right where he was, he was right next to Jesus. Jesus said, the law and the prophets were preached. What was preached? Say it loud. A little louder, please. Say it slow and loud. The law and the prophets. Now, what do they refer to? The law is referring to all the ceremonial laws that were laid out by God to Moses to give to the priests concerning the tabernacle, concerning the attraction of the presence of God on earth, concerning men reaching out to God. All the laws that are in the Old Testament, that's what Christ is referring to. All the laws of the, of the Mishnah and the Torah and the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch means five. Pentateuch means five. Pentateuch is referring to the first five books of the Bible. What are they? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay. Now those five books are called what? The Pentateuch. It's a new word for you, some of you. The word Pentateuch means five. They call them the big five. Now these books contain the law, and after them you have what they call the prophets. So the prophets really begin at the end of the fifth book. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. After Deuteronomy, then you have what? Joshua. That's when the people are in the land now, and Joshua is supposed to settle these people and teach them the ways of God. From Joshua all the way to Malachi is referred to as the, the prophets. These are the books that refer to the prophecies about the Messiah coming. In other words, Moses dealt with the law. The prophets dealt with the announcement of the coming of the king. Are you clear? So the Bible is not a, a complicated book. First five books deals with the law. And then after that, from Joshua to Malachi deals with the announcement of the coming of the king. That's why it's called prophecy. Now prophecy means to see ahead, to speak something that's coming. To prophesy means to bubble over. To bubble over means you see something that is coming, you can't hold it, so you tell it. Prophecy also is defined as foresight. In other words, you see something before it happens. Now, think now. I want you to think. That means all the people from Joshua to Malachi were dealing with the coming of the king, the Messiah, the anointed one. If you read the book of Malachi, it ends with an announcement. It's the last announcement in the Old Testament. And the announcement goes like this. And I will send my servant before my face, and he will prepare the way for me. That's the way Malachi ends. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children, and the children back to the fathers, lest I come and curse the land with a curse. In other words, God is closing the, the prophecies by saying, there's someone coming before me to introduce me to everybody. That's the way Malachi ends. That's the last book in the Old Testament. Is that clear? Everybody still with me? Okay, I want you to be wise believers, young people. Now, therefore, when you study the Old Testament, that's from Joshua to Malachi. Remember that all you are really dealing with, don't read too much into this area. All you're dealing with is the preparation and announcement for the coming of the king, the Messiah, 
who is coming to restore what Adam lost. What did Adam lose? The kingdom of God, the dominion of God. And that's what the Old Testament is about. So when you read Joshua, don't get deep, don't invent prophecy, don't invent revelation. When you go into Judges, don't invent all this weird stuff. People preach about all kinds of stuff. It is, or the whole thing, matter of fact, when Jesus, listen to me, when Jesus was about to leave the earth, you remember what he said? He told those guys on the road to Emmaus. Remember the story? He was about to leave the earth, and he walked with them for a long time. Do you know what he said to them? He said, the Bible says, and he opened their eyes, and he taught them about the scriptures. Watch this. He says, and he showed them how all the scriptures was about him. I rest my case. That means every prophet, every judge, every king had something to do with preparing us for the coming of the king. The judges represent righteousness. What is righteousness? Giving someone their rights. Who are the judges? You have people like Deborah, Esther, Samson. These were judges. People who God used to give people their rights. They're like, you know, like politicians who give people their rights. But that's what Esther did. Esther saved a whole group of people who were minorities in the country. She was giving them justice. That's why she was a judge. Deborah took over an army and routed the enemy to protect and preserve a people who was being abused. She became a judge. Well, who do they represent? It says when the king comes, he will execute righteous judgment. So God was using these judges to set up an example for us to see how the king is going to bring justice to the earth. What is justice? Giving people what is rightfully theirs. That's what Christ came to do. So you get Joshua, and then you get who next to Joshua? What's the next book? Judges, and then you got who? Ruth. Now, who is Ruth? Ruth is a book. Simply don't, don't get deep about Ruth. Don't start saying the church is in there and the revelation. Ruth is about the lineage of the Messiah. That's all it is about. It's about God preserving the lineage that he said to Abraham that the Messiah will come through pure blood and that he will include all the nations of the world. And Ruth represented the inbreeding, or should I say the, the integration of the Gentile into the lineage of Jesus. What's the next book? Some of you already know your books in the Bible. What's the next book? What's that? You're all saying different things now. You're getting nervous. First and second, Samuel. What is Samuel? Samuel now introduces what? He's the first prophet. What's he going to talk about? He's going to talk about the king coming of Jesus. But this is when the nation started asking for a king. And God says, look, I want to be your king. Wait for me. They said, we ain't waiting on you. We want our own king like the other nations. And that's why Samuel came in the picture. And Samuel said to them, you do not want a king. Why? God is sending a prophet to tell them about a future king. He says, look, I will be your God. You will be my people. You don't need a king like this. I got plans for you. I got already got a king already reserved in my back pocket. He's coming in the right time. And the people couldn't wait, so God gave him a king. And that's when God set up what we call the kingdoms of Israel. The first king that Samuel gave them, that's the one they chose, and that was who? Saul. And then Saul, we know what happened to Saul. He disobeyed God, and then came who? David. And David is the one who pleased God, and God said, okay, since you all at least want your own king, I will establish his throne as a model. And that's what David was about. So when you study David, remember you are studying kingdom life. The future kingdom life. David will teach us about the ways of kingdom. And that's why when you study the books that David wrote, they are all about kingdom living. And then even David became a prophet and he started prophesying about the Lord who is his Lord. And the king who is his king. And he started talking about this king who will go to the grave and the dead cannot keep him and he'll come back. And I mean, David started prophesying not about his great kingdom, but about the kingdom that was greater than his. It was all about a kingdom. Then you get Chronicles. What is Chronicles? Don't read Chronicles and come up with no in inventions of revelation. Chronicles simply means history. 
These are the histories of the kings that came out of the kingdoms. When you read Chronicles, don't look for no deep revelation and create things that ain't there. And believe me, friends, you know, I used to do that, so don't, you know, don't feel bad. Some preachers go into the Bible and invent things. That's why it's important for you to understand the purpose for the book so you don't start creating a new book out of the book. Can I hear an amen? Chronicles is simply, it simply means history. To, to chronicle something means to record it. So Chronicles means the recordings of the histories of the king. You got first, second book, Chronicles, and they record all the actions. So you read those, you learn about kingdoms and bad kings and good kings and kings that didn't work and kings that worked and kings that pleased God, kings that didn't please God, and kings that build the city, kings that destroyed the city. In other words, God teaches us how kingdoms work. And what's the next one? Esther. Now, thank God, God. Ezra. Oh, you say Esther. Ezra. Ezra is who? A prophet. Why? Because the kings became corrupt. So God sent, what, another prophet back to tell the people, that's okay, even though these kings are messed up, there's another king coming. And Ezra prophesies about the Messiah. Then you got who coming next? Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah has been used by God to prove them, to prove to the people that there's hope. The city is broken down, the walls are all messed up, the people are scattered, and God uses this young man named Nehemiah to bring hope back to the people and to tell them that there is hope kings coming that are going to be a blessing to them. God has not forgotten them. So Nehemiah becomes the one who re rebuilds the wall. And then who we got after Nehemiah? Thank God for Esther. Let me tell you why I like God for Esther. God threw a woman in just to make sure the men don't get carried away. Say amen, women. Amen. Say women, men. <laughs> Esther was one of the greatest leaders in history. A magnificent woman and it means that God wants to use women to be queens just like he has men to be kings in your mind in other words a king and a queen are both rulers except one is in a female suit that's in the male suit that's all it is so women are, are rulers and don't dominate us and have authority like men do in God's kingdom Esther came to preserve the seed because the seed that Christ was going to come through was the nation of Israel and they were about to be annihilated and God used Esther to preserve those people so that the seed could be born. Who's after Esther? Job. You all know old Job. Job had a job done on him. Job, I believe, was put in there just to symbolize the fact that no matter what happens in the kingdom of God, you still win. Say amen. And some of you all are in your Job situation right now. But see, Job had a vision of a king. And when you read Job, Job talks about this king. He says, no matter what this king does, you still win. Whatever the king allows, you still win. Because his kingdom cannot be stopped by conditions. Job proved us that the kingdom of God is durable. What's after Job? Psalms. Psalms is simply a songbook. It's the song written by a king about a king. It's a bunch of songs that we sing to the king. And it's written by a king. His name is David. And David's job is to show us how the king is glorious, his majestic kingdom. I mean, David is the one who really gives us a description of kingdom like no one else. Matter of fact, if you want to learn about kingdoms, study the books of David. Read them carefully. Because David, remember, David is the one that God is going to use to be a model for his kingdom. That's why when Jesus came, it says that he shall be set on the throne of David. The word throne means place of authority. That means that God's going to use David as a model to show you what the Messiah is going to really be like. And then we got after Psalms, Proverbs. Proverbs is written by David's son. One of the next great kings, his name is Solomon. Solomon wrote the wisdom of God in those books to show us how kingdom life is supposed to be. God gave wisdom to Solomon to teach us ethics and morals and how to live with one another, how to be patient, how to be diligent in your job, how to be, how to be committed and have character. That, that whole book is about building the person who lives in the kingdom. And then we got what? Ecclesiastes. That book deals again with the wisdom of God, but most importantly, it's a, it's a sarcasm. Ecclesiastes is a sarcasm. A sarcasm is actually a statement that teases mankind. It makes fun of mankind. The book of Ecclesiastes makes fun of us. It actually tells us, you are trying to live without God, and it ain't working. 
That's what it, the whole book is about. It teases us. It tells us, I dare you to try to live without God. That's why the book begins like this. The book begins, meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. And it ends by this. There's only one thing that a man should do. Should obey God's word, live according to the commandments of God, and he'll have long life. That's how it ends. In other words, the whole book is about don't you try to do nothing without God or you're going to waste your time. What's after Ecclesiastes? Songs of Solomon. This is the most sexual book in the Bible. This book is to show us how we ought to stay committed to our spouse, male and female, and how we are to express our love and our intimacy. It's a book about the natural release and relationship between a man and a woman and how they should enjoy the pleasure of being together as humans. A lot of folks take this book and make it all kind of things. In other words, Solomon wrote a book. Now, Solomon was an expert on this. You know that. <laughs> Solomon had so many women in his life. He had every experience you could think of. Solomon is an interesting guy. Solomon had more wisdom and he used none of it. Any man who got more than one woman in his life ain't smart. Come on, y'all talk to me. Solomon had many? A thousand. It's a crazy man. That's why the kingdom fell apart after Solomon died. He didn't apply what he knew. Let me tell you something. Even though you're getting good teaching in here, you could be just like Solomon. People say, you go to BFM and you're still doing that stuff? I know Pastor Miles don't teach you all that. See, because you see, you can know wisdom, but don't apply it. And Solomon lost the kingdom. And to this day, the kingdom never came back. Why? Because Solomon didn't apply the wisdom that he learned. And then we get next to, to Solomon's writing is what? Isaac, some of you are reading the back of your Bible. Like I said, now nah, this is a book here. <laughs> Isaiah, and you got what? Jeremiah, then you got Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Jose, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. Then you got Micah, Nehemiah, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Now, all those books from then on, after Solomon messed up, God says, that's it. I ain't taking no more chances. So God been sending prophets ever since that. Every book is a prophet. And every prophet is talking about who? The Messiah. Let's read Isaiah. Let's see what Isaiah says. Now, I want you to know that the prophet that began the real ministry of prophecies is Elijah. Everybody say Elijah. Elijah is an important prophet. He's the one who started the whole thing. Elijah is the one who God used excuse me, to show his power of his kingdom. Elijah was the guy who made the axe head swim in the ocean. In, in, in the river. He's the one who called fire from heaven and burned up all that water and that, that calf and everything. I mean, Elijah was a dangerous prophet. He showed, by the way, Elijah showed the power of the kingdom of God more than any other prophet in the Old Testament. He proved it. Now, before we read Isaiah 9, let me make one more statement to help you understand this. Do you remember when Jesus came to earth? He had a meeting on a mountain. On the mountain, he had a meeting with two people that they thought was dead. Remember that? Now, I want you to remember who he met with. Who did he meet with? Moses and who? Elijah. He didn't meet with, with Abraham, nor did he meet with David. Interesting. Why? Because Moses represents what? The law. Elijah represents who? The prophets, see? So now he's about to bring the book to a close. His, that meeting on that mountain was not... Let's look at me, please. I'm going to give you a revelation. Write this down. The meeting on the mountain was not about transfiguration. There's your first correction. The meeting on the mountain was about transferring. Got it? Christ didn't go on that mountain to show off his clothes and his power, his color. He went to have a meeting to pick up the batons. He went to close two books. He went to say thanks to some fellas he made. Anybody here? So he went to Mo. He said, Mo, you did a good job. You got the law in the planet. Thank you very much. That's the finish for you. Elisha, you talked about me coming. Guess what? 
I'm here. He represents the prophets. He represents the law. And that's why Christ says, from the time of Moses to John the Baptist, the law and the prophets were preached. In other words, now I'm going to get in trouble here, but I'm going to take a chance for my life. And then it's up to you to prove me wrong. The only thing that the people in the Old Testament before John the Baptist could have preached, including John, was the law and the prophets. They had to preach about the law and the prophecies about the Messiah coming. In other words, all they could preach was he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. I don't care how they said it, that's all they could say. All they could say is this is the way you should live and he's coming. This is the way you should live and he's coming. The law is the way you should live and he's coming is the prophecy. I'm going to get in trouble now, watch this. He said, from Moses to John the Baptist, that is what was preached. He said, but now, everybody say, but now. Man, I'm going to show you in a minute, that thing is written, that blew my mind. He said, but now, the kingdom is preached. That means from the death of John, we're supposed to be preaching only one other message. Okay. That means, oh boy, Father, you got to protect me. That means any time you go behind Matthew, any time you turn your Bible behind Matthew, that is only for reference. You should not get your message from the Old Testament. Anything before John is only reference notes. That is why, read my lips, Jesus never preached the law. Why? Because the Bible introduces Jesus in Matthew 5 and it says... The law and the prophets are fulfilled in him. Clap your hands. The most important meeting that took place in the life of Jesus was not the Lord's Supper. It was that meeting on that mountain. You ever wonder why he took the three guys with him? Three Jews, his best friends, Peter, James, and John. He took them and he actually allowed them to see it. He could have gone there by himself. He, many times he went by himself to pray. But this time he wanted them to see this meeting. And the Bible says they were able to watch the meeting. And when they were finished, they were so blown away. They said, let's just stay up here. Let's build three houses, one for Mo, one for Elijah, and one for you. They were so impressed. They saw a real live meeting. They were watching the last messages on the planet come to an end. The law... And the prophets. Do you remember what happened when they asked to build the three temples, the, the three houses? Do you remember what, what, what happened after that? Anyone remember what happened after that? Huh? A voice. That's very important. Now notice, it was in Jesus who spoke. Let me tell you why. You see, <laughs> the law and the prophet, he was not destroying them. He was saying that they have fulfilled their duty. They have completed their assignment. That's why he says, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to tell them, you have fulfilled your duty. Oh, come on. He said that the Lord did good. 
David is born. And the prophets did their job, but they ain't got to talk about me coming anymore. I hear. Come on, y'all talk to me. I didn't come to destroy them. I came to tell them thanks. So that meeting, and the Bible says, and there appeared unto them with him, Moses and Elijah, it says, and they were what? Talking to each other. You see, the reason why God sent me today at this moment into your life is because he wants me to tell you what the conversation was. Clap, man. That's a good revelation. The conversation was about the closure of an assignment. That's why the voice said, it's very important now, it's the revelation coming. Hang on, I feel the anointing here. Hang on. Hallelujah. Peter had the same spirit on him that is on the religious church today. Stay with me. The religious church wants to keep what God let go. And they want to build a house for it so they could visit it. You get it. They said, look, let's, they didn't say that was nice. They said, let's stay here, that's number one, and let's build a house. Three of them, he says, one from these, this guy. Oh, don't you get it? He was about to build a house for a dead man. And that's what religion does. It keeps building houses for dead people. They want to freeze history and hang around it. And most of our religion is nothing but old, dried up bones of history that ain't working, and we keep going there every week. Keeping things alive that God killed a long time ago. Peter said, let's just stay here. What do you mean stay here? Oh, the whole world going to hell. Down in the valley, people are suffering, Peter. What do you mean stay up here and just sit around these tombs? And that's what we do. Matter of fact, that's why we build churches in the middle of graveyards. You want to be close to dead people? And sometimes we dare even put them in the church. Listen, that voice is important because the voice didn't allow even Jesus to speak. The father was getting involved now. The father said, look, this ain't to do with you, Peter. Leave my program alone. Boy, I tell you. See, religion is man's program. Lord, I'm going to get all of this mess up now. All the things we create, look at what we've done. We got it all worked out, and God saying, uh, who made that? What is a Baptist? I mean, the Bible has no indication of a Methodist. Nothing to do with Church of God prophecy. Nothing in the Bible to do with Seventh-day Adventist. Nothing in the Bible to touch Pentecostal. We invent these things. And we build houses over them. And we keep visiting these things. That's why God hasn't done work yet. God is telling you, you and me, shut your mouth and hear him. Is that what the voice said? The voice said to Peter, shut up and hear him. And the Bible says, and when they looked up, watch this. It says Moses was gone and Elijah was gone and only he alone. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> In other words, I don't want you to think about the law. Don't talk about prophecy no more. He here. Everybody say, he here. Yeah. Say it again, he's here. Yeah. Say the kingdom is here. Yeah. Everything was about the kingdom. Why are we still talking about it after it's here? It's time to live in it. Religion 
gathers, its, gathers itself around dead history. That's what it does. The Methodist has a method that John Wesley established. The Pentecostals are still in Jerusalem, even though you can't go there no more. The Anglican, they mad because they wanted to get a divorce, and the Pope wouldn't give it to them. The Catholics, they froze every saint and trying to go through them. But higher faith says all roads lead to the same place. That, now you, you can get lost that way. <laughs> I mean, the list goes on. The Baptists, I ain't sure what they do it. I was one of them, so don't, I ain't picking nobody. I grew up in the Baptist church, man. Listen to me. I ain't never hear no kingdom in the Baptist church. No, no preaching of the kingdom. I'm not picking on these churches. I'm trying to show you that when you look up, the only place you're supposed to see. <laughs> hallelujah. Hallelujah. I say hallelujah. I say hallelujah. The first chapter of Hebrews and the second chapter, it says, and now we see Jesus. It says what? Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. He is what? The author? Listen, Moses don't start nothing and finish nothing for you. Elijah ain't starting. He is the only one that this is about. What he says is what we preach. Now, friends, listen to me. The voice said, shut up. That means hold your peace and hear him. And when they looked up, the Old Testament was gone. That means all that is for now is reference. The Old Testament is used to prove that the New Testament is real. That's all it is. You don't, you don't live in there. You don't get revelation from there. Try to get teach. Your teaching comes from the new covenant. Now, it says, hear him. That means what he's about to say, that's what you listen to. Not what Mo said or not what Elijah said. You're going to hear what he says. What does he say? He comes saying, repent. First message. For the kingdom of heaven has arrived. It says in John, Matthew 4, 17, what? It says from that time forward, Jesus began to preach. Now we're talking about preaching. Now what do you preach? He said, repent. For the kingdom of heaven has arrived. The message is about the kingdom. I challenge you today to get yourself for a ride ready for a ride. We're going on a ride. You, you thought you knew God. Let me tell you why your bills ain't getting paid too right and sickness still ramp, ramp, rampaging into our lives and here's why we can't get our businesses out of, out of red and, and why ministries are in trouble. Here's why we're having struggles with all of our relationships. Let me tell you why. Because we have not learned the kingdom keys yet. There's a way out of every situation. Oh, Holy Ghost. I'm going to say it again. There's a way out of everything you're going through. But the problem is finding that way. That's the key. That's what the key is. The keys are the principles that get you out. When Christ needed to pay taxes, the disciple says, we don't have any money to pay taxes. And some of y'all feel that way right now. You owe people this week and you ain't got money to pay them. The kingdom got some ways. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, hey, Lord. Oh, the kingdom got some. You haven't even dreamt of the way the kingdom got to pay your bills. I mean, who would have thought you can go catch a fish? Come on, talk to me. And pay everybody's taxes. We're going to learn them keys. Tell your neighbor there's a way out of everything. And I want you to say it like you mean it. Come on, tell them. 
There's a way out, Shirley, of everything. Whatever you are in, there is a way out of that. Give the Lord a praise. You're going to learn them ways. We're going to learn them ways in Jesus. Isaiah. Uh, next week, we can talk about the king. But I wanted to close today just on a, on a little brief note about citizenship. Because kingdom is about citizenship. It's about becoming part of a country. Everybody say country. A kingdom is a country. And Christ introduced a country. Here's what it says in the Bible. This is the plan, very simple, simple plan. God's original plan was for man to rule over earth. We know that. And then God saw the fall of man, which is a fall from rulership. In other words, man lost government over the earth. And then thirdly, God sent Jesus Christ simply to restore the government of heaven back to earth. That's not complicated. Isaiah 9. Let's read Isaiah 9. Let's see what it says here. In verse 6. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government he is bringing on his shoulders. Keep reading. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his what? Government, there will be what? No end, and of his peace, no end. In other words, he's bringing a government. It didn't say an increase of his religion. He's bringing a government back, a kingdom back. And then it connects, watch this. It says, and he will reign on David's throne. In other words, he's going to reign after the model of David. You know what David did? Look at me. Here's Revelation. God give me stuff. Sometimes I say, God, why, why didn't I know that 20 years ago? He said, because you weren't ready for it. Here's what God showed me. This statement means the same way God brought David in, he can bring the king of kings in. Do you know what David did? David is the only king in history, in Israel, that routed all the enemies. I got to show you this revelation. Look at me. Solomon had a lot of enemies. Solomon never subdued his enemies. Matter of fact, you remember that the last enemy Solomon had was a big guy named Goliath. Remember that guy? And when David came, little boy came with a little bike, he saw the big fella cussing out the Israelites. Remember that? Calling them dogs and stuff. And this little shepherd boy walk up there, and here's big King Solomon hiding in his tent. Saul, sorry, Saul. Thank you very much. Hiding in his tent. And telling the other fellows, you all go get him, go get him. And all of them scared to go. Little David walks up and says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine talking bad about my God? Little kid. God says, I like his attitude. He said, why don't one of you go out and kill him? And they said, are you crazy? You see how big he is. His spear is bigger than my tent. His shield is bigger than my chariot. David says, he's too big to miss. <laughs> you all got to think differently this week, eh? And David says, okay. And they try to put on David, listen to me, their traditions. Lord have mercy. Well, guess what? David come back. See how good he looks? My name is David. Look at this. See that? Right. And I've come to take off Solomon's, uh, Saul's armor from you today. This series will take off Saul's armor. Because you can't fight in the old traditions. Now remember, he's coming to sit on what? David's throne. In other words, God's using David as a model for the Messiah, the king. How did Jesus come? Jesus came as a little boy, and he walks into the temple with the big traditional fellas and blew them away at age 12. Then he never joined the Sanhedrin Council, never became a Pharisee, never became a Sadducee. He never wore their religious armor. Come on, talk to me. Why? 
Because he knew that the devil already had them covered. The devil was not afraid of Caiaphas. He wasn't afraid of, 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 of the Sadducees, nor the, Sad, nor the Pharisees. But Jesus said, uh huh, got you. I ain't putting on their clothes, and I can have your head today. You're supposed to shout right there. That means you didn't get my message. Let me say it again. Jesus came to earth, looked at the arm of religion, and said, I cannot put that on, and the devil know how to fight that. So I can fight him with something he ain't never thought of before. Oh, hallelujah. I'm going to fight him with the word of God only. Come on, somebody. Hey! Excuse me. <laughs> Just like David said to Goliath, today I come to you in the name of the Lord. Well, the Bible says, blessed is he that comes riding on the donkey in the name of the Lord. Just like David came. And he looks lowly and unhumble, like he can't kill nobody. But I'm telling you, he got some rocks in his pocket. Yeah. Y'all ain't singing, man. I'm ready to shout by myself. In other words, the same way David came, little sling, Christ came, you know, like a sheep, led to slaughter. Say, no, no, he's about to get whipped. You know how to praise Jesus, man. Just like David came, I'm coming just like that. Jesus knew the spot where to hit the devil. <laughs> the devil said, I'm going to kill you. Jesus says, make my day. That death was the death of the devil. When the devil killed Jesus, Christ killed the devil. Give him a praise. Let's worship him for a second. Hallelujah. Man, this is our day, man. We're coming out. Jesus came on the throne of David. Now watch this. Solomon did not re subdue his enemies. Saul, rather. Look at Solomon. Saul. Saul died with the enemies still around. So when David became king, I want you to follow this. David attacked all his enemies and what did he use he used the weapon of praise so this 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 thing they was carrying you ain't saying man you all missed that you all praise people david says okay solomon you saw it i got one a trick for y'all this is the day <clears throat> this is the day and the king says ha 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 and he goes, boom they were dead David used a weapon they never had training for. Man, y'all ain't listening to me. The devil didn't know what Christ was coming with. He thought he was coming on a horse with a sword as a Messiah. Because that's what the religious people thought too. Religion always expects the wrong thing. I'm saying heavy things today. Please get this taped. Religion always expects something that God didn't plan. They expect the second coming of Jesus. And I tell you all that's wrong. It's the third coming. Now if you expect something that ain't coming, your expectation will never be meant. So you keep postponing it. The people who was around Israel didn't know how to fight David. He was a king who spent all of his time writing worship songs. The biggest book in the Bible is a song book written by a king with a bunch of worships. Man, you all talk to me. This messed the people up. So how, in the, how are we going to fight a guy who just sings? Come on, you all praise me, man. Praise him, praise him, praise him. This is, this, ha. Ah. He said, the same way David came, my son is going to come. He's going to mesmerize them. You see, they expect him to be born in a castle. Guess where he's born? In a cave. Oh, I won't stop. I got nine minutes. Listen. You remember when they went to find David in the house? You remember when the Saul went to get David? Saul, Saul? I mean, uh, Samuel? Just like Jesus. They brought the best sons out. The well-dressed ones. 
the handsome ones, the intelligent ones, the ones with all the pedigree and the credibility and the credentials and the son and the prophet said, mm -mm. <laughs> They said, well, it's the one with the sheep. Guess where he was born? With the sheep. He shall be on the throne of David. He'll be a mighty counselor coming out of a cave. The devil was prepared for Jesus, but he wasn't prepared for Christ. No, he prepared for Christ. He wasn't prepared for Jesus. He, he knew Christ is God, but he didn't know how Jesus was coming. <laughs> Hallelujah. Can you imagine Goliath laughing? <laughs> you all sent me a dirty little nappy head runt. This little day, nap your drunk off your head today. Yes, sir. One rock, one giant coming home today. Praise God. I can imagine Jesus Christ looking at all the history of sin. Looking at the millions of sinners trapped. And the devil laughing, saying, God, you didn't send an army to get me. You only sent a little small puny fellow from Nazareth. God said, that's okay. He's going to have your head. Let me tell you something. The authority is in the head. That's why the Bible says in the book of uh, Genesis 3.15, I will send the seed and he shall crush. David went after the head, didn't he? Christ went after the head, didn't he? Victory. Here's the bottom line. When David came into the kingship, the Bible says, and David routed all the enemies of Israel. Routed means that he attacked them, subdued them, and took all of his enemies out. Now listen carefully. I mean, let me tell you how to prove it. It says, and in the times of David, oh, listen to me, man. All the enemies of Israel were subdued, the Bible says, and there was no more enemy to fight. Listen to me. That's why David could finally settle down and put his attention on building what he calls the city of Salam. Salam means peace. Jeru means city. Jeru Salam means city of peace. Why? There was no more wars. Everybody was conquered. That's why David set up his throne. He had peace. He was in charge of the whole world. Now let me preach before I go. Jesus said, I'm coming. And the strong man got the house. He said, but no man can take over a strong man house until he first buys the strong man and takes back the spoil. That's why the Bible says that he who descended also ascended and brought gifts back to men. He brought the keys of death and the grave. It says, and now he is sad. Stand up on your feet, somebody. Go ahead and praise the king for a couple of seconds before we go. This is his hour. It's the hour of the kingdom. 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 Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.